when I talk in a different voice, it sounds like Shrek. So it never works. It never works right. So I just don't even try. Really okay, we'll try do now. it. <laughs> no. uh. Welcome to Bonus Features, a podcast where we dive into the crazy, unexpected, and interesting details that we didn't have time to talk about on Sunday. When you get into God's word, God's word gets into you. Well, guys, today we talk about the book of Second Chronicles. Uh, we talk a lot about comparisons to previous books that we've discussed and also have an uncomfortably long conversation about gout and maybe hear Pastor Kevin's donkey impression. So on that note, my name is Caroline. I am our host for our podcast. I'm joined today by Pastor Kevin and Pastor Jason, our resident nerd. Hola. That's a nice boulder. <laughs> just get to it, right? <laughs> That's just what right we have in store yeah. for this episode Guys, of the this is what's coming. All right, guys, today, Second Chronicles. Last, last week we did First Chronicles and uh, Psalms. This week we're going into Second Chronicles. We're going, we're finishing out maybe. Well, no, I guess not. There's a, there's a little bit more to come. But uh, Pastor Kevin, you know, you you brought the sermon this yes, this week. It was fun. Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles. Good times. Was that, was that one that you were like, yes, I get to. So I did Second Kings mm. and Second Chronicles. So it's basically preaching the same book of the Bible twice. <laughs> That's kind of what it felt like. Were they like, e, do this, yeah, no, do this it was better? Just like, what do I, yeah, what do I find different? Like <laughs> You did great the first time. <laughs> exactly. Let's run it yeah, again. Right. <laughs> sermon prep's got to be awesome. Yeah, it's, it's already done. A few it was already done. I know. Yeah? Okay. So yeah, it's good times. Or was it like sequel vibes, but when you're retelling the story? No, it was a, a remake. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sequel would be after. That's, have that's you seen better. movies, Caroline? I, tell me more about so, them. I don't think yeah, I have. Sequels <laughs> come after. <laughs> yeah. Remakes yeah. are the same thing told Ah, once. but also come after, to my point. Usually, yeah. <laughs> good way of working that back around. <laughs> yeah, I just make myself look slightly less dumb here. <laughs> Uh, okay. Well, anyway, let's talk about, well, that to be re fair, fair though, like that really is something that might be kind of difficult to look back through an entire story that is very similar. So what, what was your thought process with that? With what, which things were you going to pull out? Did you retell some of the same things from different perspective? Was it, uh, kind of, so we'll talk about it today and you know, the books are different. So mm -hmm. one's like a legit history book. The other is kind of almost a theology of history book. And so that, because that makes them different, it was, it was sort of easy Second Kings, I've talked a little bit more about actually what the kings did. Mm. In this one, it's much more about what God did on yeah. behalf of the kings and behalf of the nation. So it was a lot more about that. Uh, I, I tried to pull a lot more history stuff and find ways that that connected. This one was easier because, honestly, it's it's the presence of God just in our lives and yeah. in history. So it was, it was, it was easy. Yeah. Yeah. Easier, not easy, but easier. <laughs> yeah, it was easy. It was, it was simple. <laughs> yeah. It was fun. It was fun. Yeah. And I got to use the Slinky on stage. So when do you get to do that, man? It, I mean, it I feel like yeah. that engaged Slinky's people. Work. Yeah. You know how many people put that on their Christmas list after yesterday? Zero. Exactly <laughs> zero. Because you did not yeah. sell the idea of a Slinky very well. well you were like, look so at the lamest toy As ever. a gift idea, terrible. Yeah. But still make millions of dollars each year. Like it's still like a. a Who is buying legit, Slinkies right now? Me for the sermon. <laughs> <yesterday>. <laughs> so I bought one. Slinky's got one. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, Slinky's a wonderful toy. So did you ever successfully get it down steps though? Like no. any steps. So ever? I'll tell you what I learned because I looked it up on the internet, which everything's true on the internet. Yeah, Abraham so, Lincoln said that. Right. So when you look up uh, the Slinky commercial, when they made the commercial. Nobody knows this, but I'm about to expose Slinky, okay? They, mm -hmm. when you go down the stairs with the Slinky, the stairs are narrower in the commercial. Household oh. stairs aren't actually that narrow. So, so they that's were always why setting works. you up for failure. Yes. That is tricky. Right? And people still bought them. Yeah, and I could have said that yesterday and it would have gone all over, but today I wanted to say it to the World Wide Web. So now everybody classified. Both. All right, you Slinky, if you're know. watching, you can comment below That's where right. to send our letters of They're not frustration. Be sending me any uh, stock <laughs> in Slinkies? <laughs> Slinky at this toy sucks. Not a publicly traded company. Is Slinky a publicly traded company? It can't be. Yeah. They, it had to have been like bought up, acquired, and <laughs> dissolved. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, yeah, I got nothing. It's, it's living with all the old toys like Light Brights, which is what I dressed up as for Halloween. And no children know what a Light Bright was. You've had those in the prize hub here at LifePoint. 
I, yeah. Which was our Lifebrite's in the prize hub. Oh, yeah. They, they, so, they have been. Yeah. For everybody watching or listening, we have a prize hub for our LifePoint kids where they can come and earn tokens for bringing their Bible, knowing the memory verse, all that kind of fun stuff. And they can earn diff- or cash them in for different things. So you might be thinking, is that like bribery? To which I would say, yes. And it works. And kids are learning the word of God. And I think it's effective. But anyway, um, yeah, we put light brights in there and kids loved them. Mm-hmm. And I dressed up as a light bright and all these kids are like, what are you? And I'm like, you're a colorful cell phone. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever, Spider-Man, get out of here. <laughs> well, I feel like Let you me just alone. went over some parents too, because if you are a parent, you do believe in bribery. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Listen, it's a great parenting technique. Great tool. I, yeah, I think it works. Especially at church. Come on. We're redeeming I know. bribery. That's fine. <laughs> Anyway, so Second Chronicles. <laughs> Second Chronicles is, a, is an awesome book. Patrick Kevin, I thought you did a great job, too. It was yeah. an awesome oh, thanks, message. It was super enlightening. It was challenging. Uh, and I loved I felt like I, even listening to you, I could feel where you would have gone deeper if you had more time. Sure. So that was yeah. kind of even just what I wanted to bring up just to kick it off. So before we, we jump in and, like, and actually like bench through the Bible today mm-hmm. or mm-hmm. going to go back into like the there. extra features, you like that? Yeah, plug mm-hmm. this. <laughs> plug this. Self-promotion. <laughs> it's awesome. It's encouraged. But just to get a little bit more of, of who we're writing to, because there's a huge time lapse between Kings and Samuel mm-hmm. and the book of Chronicles, and even who the intended audience is, and even the, the purpose. Is com- they're completely different. They pull from the same stories, but it's for a completely different reason. Yeah. So if you could have gone a little deeper in that yesterday, what, what would you have said? Uh, well, it's also the nation's different. Mm-hmm. I mean, that and we did kind of hit on the fringes of that, but to me, those books were written as, as solely historical books uh, meant to preserve their, their history. It's no different than if you go to D.C. and you walk through museums and you mm-hmm. see things that preserve our history. That, that's what the majority of those books were kind of built for and to talk about the sovereignty of what a king was about. Yeah. Second, first and Second Chronicles <laughs> is different because people are in a different state of mind. Like they're, they're not trying to preserve anything because... They don't have anything yep. anymore. It's a nation that all of that that they had has been totally gone. I mean, we see it in the, the city itself. It was burned. It was destroyed. The temple was gone. So what the writer of that book is doing is he's essentially trying to retell their history, but tell it in a way that says, look, the same God that did all that can do it again. Yeah. And I think for us, sometimes we, we read them and we'll see stories that are the same and stories that are different. But First and Second Chronicles, when you read it, you really need to read it through the lens of this is to a people who are completely broken. And not, the only thing that they have right now is a promise. Yeah. They've been released to go back into their, their home country and they have a promise that it can thrive again. That's all. Yeah. So when I think if it's Ezra or whomever wrote it, I actually think is a, a great leader because what he did, like one of the first things a leader does is define the need, like define reality. And reality was, is that they didn't believe that they could rebuild their nation. I bet they didn't know if God would even come along. All of those things that they had heard about God doing were just stories. Yeah. They were stories that other people told that they never experienced. So they needed a heightened sense of, hey, when the exact same thing that you're doing right now was done the first time, here's how God was involved. When the exact same people did the exact same steps, here's how God showed up on their behalf. And it's just, it's a history book that reminds you of God's place in history. And we all need that. I mean, it's why we read the pages of the Bible still, is to remind us that, hey, when people went through this, here's how God intervened on their behalf. When sin was rampant, here's what Jesus did. When You know, it it reminds us of that. And so that, to me, that's what I would have pushed in harder on, was more examples of that. Yeah, I think the entire book is that. Well, and I think that's goal too, and especially you know because one of the goals for for this series and and even this podcast. Uh, so if you're watching, thanks for watching. But the the goal for most of this is not to just explain every little thing and give every answer for every question. It's really to help define like how do we read the Bible? What's good to look for? Like what are we supposed to to look at while we're we're going through it? So the goal is to give just like a big overview. But just like with any context, I do believe that the Word of God interprets itself. I believe that Mm -hmm. context interprets context. Um, And I also believe that the Holy Spirit speaks to us while we read it. But it's also good to kind of know some of the background. Like that's why we know or look at when it was written, who it was written to, what, what, who was the intended audience, because there's so much that could escape uh, the actual context. Yeah, the, the one thing I would add on that, sometimes when we're going through that, even in the, the series, we'll give dates and audience and those kind of things. 
one of the things we forget sometimes is that the people in the Bible were not just characters in a play. Yeah. But they were people with emotions and feelings yeah. and discouragement and hopefulness and hopelessness and all the things that we still feel. So, like, imagine, like, right now in our country, you know, there's people that disagree and they disagree loudly and social media lets it be really, really loud. Mm -hmm. So imagine like all of that turmoil while we live through that, what most of us haven't lived through. And depending on where you're joining us from, I'm not sure your situation, but most of us haven't lived through a complete collapse of a government yeah. mm -hmm. and then seen everything that we know, love and put our faith and trust in either burned to the ground or hauled off into exile. Yep. Yeah. So when you think about that, the reason some of the Bibles is, Bible is written the way that it is is because it was difficult, difficult, difficult times. Yeah. And we need to see God moving through that. Yeah, that's yeah. awesome. And also, just if you're listening or watching and you're um, you're wondering what we're talking about as far as like the series and the sermon and stuff like that, we, we're part of a church in Wilmington, North Carolina called Life Point. We're doing a series. Uh, we've been doing a series. How long have we been doing it? For not, well, this not is quite a year. Three. This is season yeah. three. So it's come, we've, we've been renewed not once but twice, not to brag, hashtag humble brag. <laughs> uh, but we started, our, our lead pastor, Pastor Jeff, uh, decided a couple months ago that he really wanted to, to take our church deeper into the Bible. So we've been going through a series off and on this year called Binge the Bible. So, you know, we've been going through books of, of the Bible one at a time, sometimes combining them, sometimes breaking them into a couple different, but... The point of all of it really ha has been to just get into the word and kind of Pastor Kevin, how you're saying, like understand more about, especially the Old Testament. People think like there's not much in that for me, is not much to that is applicable to my life. But we've really found week after week that there's so many things, uh, you know, that that people are learning and also able to apply to their lives in different ways. Mm -hmm, yeah. And really, just like you said, proof of God's faithfulness and and His sovereignty through all of the story of humanity of you know of the world and um, how that really applies to each and every one of us so uh, we have you know all of our episodes on our podcast uh, platforms as well so you can go back and listen to all of those uh, binge them all you know what nice. I mean? good one yeah good, good point. Uh, no and I would I would echo that and I would just say if you are joining us and and I know for me when I first came to faith one of the things that I didn't feel qualified to do was to read the Bible and mm -hmm. part of the reason was when they would tell me in church, like, open up to this book, everybody else would open to that book. And I was still searching, you know, 10 minutes later. And what we're trying to accomplish here is exactly what Caroline was saying. It's, it's give an overview so that you feel confident when you dive into the Bible. So that when you're reading it on your own or you're studying it on your own, while you may not be qualified to like, you know, teach a, a class in seminary, that, that's okay. If, you're, if you feel qualified to engage the Bible on your own and allow God to speak to you, that's what this is about, exactly. is helping you position yourself in a way that God can speak to you. Yeah, it's providing that starting point. And this is a good place to ask questions. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Uh, and so for even now, like it's use us as that starting point to help provide a perspective to, to start to listen. So like today, one of my favorite, uh, I guess, takeaways before we kind of jump in to the material was the fact <clears throat> that Pastor Kevin, you, are, you, you said it, but like it's almost like that people, the nation of Israel, they had been uh, in exile. Uh, they, they got to live out the bad choices that, that the kings and the rest of the people. And we put a lot of blame on the kings. It wasn't just the evil kings. Yeah. They led the people astray, but then the people allowed themselves to be. Uh, led astray and so they were living out the consequences of things that happened before their time yeah. and so they're coming back defeated and uh, but I love the direction that the chronicler gave can we call him that the he's, he's the, the chronicler, chronicler. Since, since he is a known we believe it's Ezra <laughs> but he's referred to as the chronicler and I, I do like that word coming to Netflix so yeah. just kind of make it feel like also a new Batman a bad, villain got a bad case of the the chronicler uh -huh. Oh, hey, that's like a that. whole different direction. I viewed it as a superhero. And I was you going like the Riddler, the Joker uh, vibes. But it's something you need an ointment for. Yeah. <laughs> well, my back hurts, and so I'm just kind of like, yeah, you're back. Back. Okay, yeah, you're back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. But anyway, going through, so he so he puts it all in this in, in perspective. So it's like he's giving them encouragement after the reprimand. But it's also a great place to start to look at the word for how it applies to our life. Like how many of us feel like we've been kind of shunned or exiled or we've suffered consequences some were our own decisions and some were other people's decisions mm -hmm. but then we we see them receiving encouragement 
to come back to what God has promised and had already kind of established. And so that's really the direction that I love for Chronicles, and I love the way you, you took that direction, uh, Pastor Kevin. Uh, but it's really, it, and I love that this book focuses more on the institutions that God wanted to establish and had established and how he did them and why, and less about the biography of the kings. So he focuses more on like, well, this is how. So you'll see uh, with Solomon, there's a lot of focus put on uh, the temple and the instruction mm -hmm. of, of doing that because guess what? They've got to come back. They've got to rebuild yeah. it. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's all these things. But even taking some of the focus off, like to me, Solomon is probably the best example from uh, the book of Chronicles. He's mentioned elsewhere in the Bible. But if you notice, he's still talked about as a great king and all this stuff. Uh, but it's, it's really less about how excellent a leader he was and more about uh, what God was doing through him. Like, you know, one of the things you mentioned, Patrick Kevin, I'm pretty sure we talked about this when we were going through uh, Samuel, but the fact that he, he, he's known for asking for wisdom. Yeah. And, that, that's, and that's awesome. I think that was a great request. God honored it and even saw the value in it. But what if we look, take a step back to the last prayer that David prayed in, in First Chronicles. He was inspired by God to pray a prayer over the nation and his son Solomon. And if you go back and read that prayer, he's got a heavy focus on what it takes to be a godly king, and it was wisdom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so God inspired him to pray this prayer. That prayer got roots, remained faithful, gave strength, and then Solomon reaches back and was inspired by that prayer, maybe to ask for, for wisdom in this case. Yeah. So for me, I just see all these little things of uh, all these things that God did. Like even in First Chronicles, if we want to use that as an example, all the battles that were mentioned in uh, First and Second Samuel that David won were all attributed to David. Mm -hmm. First Chronicles actually talks about the generals that won those battles, mm -hmm. taking mm -hmm. some of the limelight off, off of David. But even in Solomon, we see, you know, in uh, his, before we see, he's like, you know, I built this temple. I did this for you, Lord. Well, we see in Second Chronicles, he actually asked for help doing it. And so he starts to show the humanity and the fact that he knew that he had limitations. God, I'm not really sure if I'm, if I'm worthy of this. Like, yeah. how do I do this? And so he asked for help. And so we see of some of the spotlight being taken off them as great kings, mm -hmm. and it's more like God's working through regular men that he gave a platform. No, and it, it, that even uh, trickles out later on in Jehoshaphat, maybe. Yep. I think when it's talked about with him that he brought, like, spiritual reform, but also he brought governmental reform. Like, he That's did right. some things with the government. He did some things with the military. I think, again, a little bit with Hezekiah, maybe, but Josiah as well. So it talks about, like, how God used them. But typically, and when I read it, and this might just be through my lens, I see their passion for God always stands out. And then typically the other thing that's highlighted is leadership that's beyond them, not about them. Wow, that's good. That, that mm -hmm. seems to be the thing that I notice. And it's kind of yep. what you allude to there about Solomon. Yeah. Is It's like, yes, he was great, but he wasn't great just because— God gave him wisdom that was better than everybody else. He was great because he used that wisdom to build everybody else yeah. up and to make things better. So that's a good good observation. Yeah, that's great. And I mean, and there are a few other things that uh, I think saw that are that kind of come to light. Chapter six, if if I'm not mistaken, chapter six is one of those things that was added to the story because we see Second Chronicles. There's a lot that was omitted from. Uh, that we read about in First and Second Samuel, uh, but in chapter six, there was actually some stuff that that wasn't in those books. And to me, this is one of my favorite parts of of Solomon because we see that you know we see this the Bible as one story it tells one story all the way through, and it's God's voice, God's salvation to the world. And I, I think we we kind of start to see this in chapter six, verse thirty two. And I'm a little slow with numbers, guys, but on six verse chapter six, verse thirty two. This is Solomon praying. He says, As for the foreigner who does not belong to your people Israel, but has come from distant land because of your great name. I do love this about Solomon. Mm -hmm. He's always proclaiming God's great name. Mm -hmm. And your mighty hand and your outstretched arm. When they come and uh, pray toward this temple, then hear from heaven your dwelling place. Do whatever the foreigner asks of you so that all the peoples of earth may know that your name may know your name and fear you as you do your own people Israel and may know that this house I have built bears your name. And so for it, to me, it speaks to like the vast amounts of resources and riches like Solomon would have needed for the temple. Mm -hmm. That was why it was such a big deal because he wanted to make a big deal of God. But he's also incorporating people that aren't supposed to be in, in the crowd. He's uh, basically saying, God, you are God for the world and you're invited to come worship here. That's great. I love that. No, that's good. So he's good stuff. I like Solomon. <laughs> He's a winner. I think we'll keep him. <laughs> he was. Oh, it's good on the fantasy can we, team. Can we talk about like funny, funny little things in the Bible too, real quick though? Mm -hmm. 
let's see, where is it? If, if we go to chapter 8, and I'm not sure, like, what your Bible titles this. Uh-huh. Um, I just read it, glanced <laughs> over it, and it struck me kind of funny. It's Solomon's other activities. Yeah, that's what mine says, too. Fun activities. Without reading the chapter, like, what would you think is, is coming in there? Well, I'm not answering little, that little question. Tennis, <laughs> little, little gym. A little tennis. Nope. That's, okay. Yeah, tennis is yeah, what I was going to say. some weightlifting, some ping pong. <laughs> that's great. But then if you glance over chapter 9, you're like, the Queen of Sheba visits Solomon. Ah. <laughs> Solomon's other activities. That's what I was thinking. I'll stop there because I feel like everybody's getting nervous when we start going in that direction. What are you talking about, Pastor Jason? <laughs> It just strikes me as funny Jason because he, 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 Solomon's got a little bit of what a reputation. Were Solomon's fun and we we <laughs> don't see that reputation mentioned in Second Chronicles, but because we've already read the first part of the book, we know my man had a little bit of reputation. Hmm. You Thousands, think you know and we talk about this in Second Chronicles how and, and this is just me off the top of my head, just as I was processing for the message too, but um, Chronicles focuses more on the good angle of the kings, mm-hmm. you know, it, it kind of even chooses the kings to talk about based on who was better. You know, it doesn't get as much into the bad ones. Um, but when it does that, I, I again, I go back to those exiles. And whenever you've gotten in trouble, like you just think about when life is bad, mm-hmm. like everything blew up in your face, nothing's what it's supposed to be. And what you need is encouragement mm-hmm. and hope and those kind of things. You already remember all the places where you blew it. Mm -hmm. You don't need to be reminded of that. Does that make sense? When I'm talking to my kids about something they've done wrong, typically as a parent, I can usually tell if they're repentant, if they're like contrite about it, like, or if they just want to get through the discipline so they can get on with their day. Yeah. And if there's a genuine humility about them, I'm not going to keep rehearsing their sins. Yeah. And when I read Second, First and Second Chronicles, I, I see that same thing in the writer, that like there's almost not a neat like, hey, we all remember Solomon wasn't perfect. We don't have to recite that over and over <laughs> again, right? And there, it it speaks to us, I think, as people who are helping lead other broken people to places of healing. Yep. That there is an appropriate time to remind them of the things where they dropped the ball, where they messed up, and then there's an appropriate time to not do that. Yeah. Like they remember, (laughs) they, they know what it feels like in the moment. And in the moment is usually the time to remind them that, Hey, whatever you've done, God's bigger than that. Mm -hmm. One day, this is going to be a story that you tell. Yeah. Does that make sense at all? And when I read that, that's, I I sort of see it in that angle. Well, and it kind of can kind of convicts me to, uh, as a parent, it convicts me because I know whenever my, my kids fail, there are times that I, I can't look past the indiscretion. I can't believe you did this. Like, and yeah. I'm giving them their punishment. We're walking it out, and I'm. And, and again, it'll hit me. I just can't believe you did. It. I had more trust. You. Like, what, right. what were you thinking? And right. in those moments, like, you, you start to see them go from uh, angry they got caught to remorseful to now just kind of broken and and down. So now, not only are they being punished, now they're not experiencing solid correction and led into a next step. Yeah. But now they're defeated. Yep. And I, I love the picture that you just painted with that because now you're bringing people out of something and it's reminding them, okay, we were, we were down, but we're not defeated. Yeah. We're, we're coming back. And That's it good. even speaks to, to me the, the, the purpose for the word because the word is for, for correction, instruction, and all the purposes of God. And I, I see that as, as healthy correction. Yeah. yeah. And so I, I, love, I love the direction. Yeah, somebody asked me that, like, why, why does Second Chronicles not talk about you know, the bad stuff of the kings. I'm like, well, they were already defeated. <laughs> they didn't need to be reminded of that. Yeah, they're, they're, they're living the they're, consequences. Yeah, they're good. They didn't need that. Yeah. And, and what they needed is what they got. Yep. And now coming back, they're just giving, they're give, seeing the instructions for what they're supposed to do. And I think we see some of the coolest things. I don't think they regain that era of the nation of Israel. Right. Um, but you do see some cool things instituted in, like, the temple once they come back and build it back. We'll get into that, you know, in, in a couple of weeks with Ezra and Nehemiah. Mm. But it also, just to touch on it briefly, it also does show the consequences of sin. Yep. God is a God of encouragement. He's a God of restoration. He's a God of hope. But when we sin, the consequences of sin, you can't outrun. Yeah. And for them, they never got back to that glory. Yeah. Like this was to get them back there. But the consequences of their sin is they were never quite back there. Yeah. yeah. And so it, it, it's sobering to us, too. Like, like God restores, but even when God restores, most often it's different. 
Yep. Mm-hmm. There's loss. Yep. Like if there's, if there's anything like if you're joining us and, and dialing in on this, we talk about a God of hope. We talk about a God of encouragement. What I believe really does matter about those previous history books is we more closely see the downfall of sin. Mm-hmm. Yep. And when sin happens, there is consequence. And we will in, in Ezra, Nehemiah, as we move forward, even into right before Jesus comes on the scene. Like we just see the long-term effect of sin and brokenness that that was a cloud over the nation of Israel. So you keep going. Yeah, but I do love the way he kind of brings all of that that back in. Even uh, he spends a ton of time talking through um, like the the details and and what went into building the the temple. Mm -hmm. And just a couple of things to pull out. I won't go into all that because for most people, they're like, I don't know what that means. It's just a bunch of measurements and materials and stuff like that. But one of the things I think is cool is back in chapter 3, is verses uh, chapter 3, verses 15 and 17, he talks about the pillars that are out front in the temple. And they talk about the southern one and the northern one. And if you look in the right hand, or on the right hand, they call it um, Hakin, or it's pronounced like Jachin, or Jachin, but it, I think it's pronounced like Hachin. Um, but it's I'm, I'm horrible at, at this part. I, Dude, just keep going. <laughs> yeah, just, yeah it's, I'm just a say train wreck, and you guys are enjoying it. <laughs> <laughs> I <I'm> am. <just laughs> listening. But it actually means he will establish, and this pillar symbolized uh, symbolizes promises. You know, mm-hmm. specifically Sweet. God's promises. Uh, on the left hand, uh, it was called Boaz, and it re- was represented of strength, and that was a reminder to the strength and the promise that uh, God had given to the house of David. So there were just reminders everywhere, and they would have understood this. Like, they mm-hmm. would have known why the Chronicler was writing to them in this direction and making a big deal out of what to us wouldn't have been huge details. Mm-hmm. That spoke a huge, mm-hmm. uh, huge significance to them. So it's pretty cool. That's really good. That's a great pickup. But then uh, we see in the rest of Second Chronicles, he really goes into the history of the kings of Judah. Mm-hmm. And, Pastor, you mentioned uh, a few of these in the message, uh, and I know we're going to talk about a few. Uh, before we get there, were there any more remarks on Solomon or anything? Because I know that, to me, this this is like my favorite part of Second Chronicles, getting into like kind of geeking out on the history and and who did what, who was good, who was bad, who was kind of good, and mm-hmm. then went bad. And no more about Solomon for me. I mean, I think um, had enough. <laughs> <laughs> Done with that guy. No, I mean, I love Solomon. <laughs> yeah, I like Solomon a lot. I, I like. Um, I think it would probably be similar for like the nation of Israel. Like when you think about David and Solomon, those are the glory years, right? Yep. And so it, it just, even when you talk about him, it feels that way. Yeah. Like those were just the glory years. And, and I like the whole, I think partially because I love the book of Proverbs and some of that wisdom literature. I just, I love him. One of the things I really like that happens, the, the way um, it happens in Second Chronicles is he builds the temple, they dedicate the temple, the presence of God shows up. He prays this prayer slash preaches this sermon in the prayer right on the heels of that. Yeah. And to me, when when I read that, I think about my personal devotion time. Like mm-hmm. that's that's the way I try to like orchestrate myself, if that makes sense, is that I don't just jump right in. Usually for me, like my personal devotion time is super early in the morning. I'm kind of a nerd. I get up really early and it's a cup of coffee. It's me just, I've got a chair in this one room in my house that I sit in and I sort of prepare, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. And it's not just like, they didn't just bring the Ark of the Covenant in when they still had, you know, beams and and sheet uh, sheet rock not dried on the wall. Like there was some preparation that happened. And I think that matters for our temple is to get prepared. Mm -hmm. And then there's bringing in the presence of God, which for them, there was worship involved, there was almost like the tilling of the ground, mm-hmm. that, if that makes sense. I know for me, I'll try to listen to a worship playlist. I actually have one from one of my former pastors that they keep updated. And so I just listen to that for like sometimes five minutes. Like it's not like forever. And then get into the Word. Yeah. Because sometimes we jump right into this. And the problem is, is we're not prepared. Our spirits aren't prepared. And it's just words. Yep. It's just checking the box. And then we try to pray on the back end, and it's just so out of whack. Yeah. And I think it's an encouragement to me to see how Solomon used God's presence or leveraged God's presence is a better word to open people up to receive the truth of what God had yeah. to say to them. That's good. Yeah. And I think it's the same for us. Yeah. There's a reason we organize worship services that way. Mm-hmm. I think it's healthy. 
when we organize personal devotion time yep. the same way. I agree. So yep. that's good. And now a quick break for today's unofficial sponsor, Connect. Connect is all about helping you grow in your relationship with God and connecting you to the community of faith here at LifePoint. Whether you're new to church or you've been a Christian for years, we can all take the next step in our faith. The best place to get started is Connect, a one-week event that will help you learn about LifePoint Church and how you can get involved. To register for Connect, visit lifepointnow.com slash connectclass. That's lifepointnow.com slash connectclass. Now, we'll get back to the episode. <clears throat> now, Pastor, I, there was one thing. You started talking about it. Um, just because we come from similar backgrounds, you know, you mentioned even in the pa- the message you're from <laughs> Pentecostal background. I'm yeah. from Pentecostal background. Come um, on, and you were t- let's run around the table. Is this, is you ready for me to jump up? <laughs> some of you, some of the people watching, they maybe they hear that and they, they're waiting for me to get loud. <laughs> exactly, exactly. God say it, die. <laughs> yeah, that's not me. We're Sorry. not bringing out <laughs> snakes. Sorry. There's no snakes. Oh yeah, we could yeah, do that because do that. we love nope. Pastor Kevin yep, and he I'm would out. kill over. Uh, but you know, got you got into where Solomon was praying, and uh, you know the glory of the Lord filled mm-hmm. filled the the temple. A little southern he come out. Filled, filled, he it, filed, it. It. it filled the temple. I say it. It's my southern evangelist coming out. Yeah. Uh, but you were talking about this, and there was one word. I just I thought you were going to mention it, and you you didn't. But it was that Shekinah. Oh yeah. Glory. <laughs> I thought that was a person in our church for years because it they it, they were awesome. mentioned every time, and every time they said, I turned around. Who is Shekinah? Like, Who is Shekinah? Is she singing a solo today? <laughs> <laughs> so the first time I ever went in a Pentecostal church, which is where I got saved, and you know, kind of it's Melissa's home church, my wife's home church. Uh, I was there probably in middle school, so I like went to a, visit a service and then didn't go back until I was like freshman in college or something like that. And so I show up, I'm there, I'm with a friend, and it was exactly what you're talking about. Like the music was good, and then all of a sudden they got excited, and then they got really excited. Somebody start running. <laughs> yeah, and then like they're just really excited, and one of my middle school teachers is in the choir, and she's like spinning in circles, like she was super excited, and then. Um, when the music stopped, it was the weirdest thing is that everybody kept talking. You know this, if yep. you've been in a Pentecostal church before, you know what I'm talking about. And then the pastor gets up on the platform and says, let's pray. Well, where I came from, when someone's praying, everybody else shuts up, <laughs> right? That is not how you roll. <laughs> Am I right? Am I right? <laughs> and he starts praying and all of a sudden the entire room starts talking like at this volume. Like he's praying. The only difference is he has a microphone, but we're all like, everybody's praying and I'm not, no eyes closed. I'm just looking around like (laughs) this is the rudest group of people, about a thousand people in the room just talking at the same time. And, uh, and then I remember he said, the pastor said in his prayer to reference this verse, he said, the glory of the Lord is moving in the building like a cloud. Mm -hmm. And just like you said, you looked around, I looked up and I was like, what? Is it for real? This is awesome. Is this a cloud inside? How do they make this work? Where's the, where's the oh, smoke dude, machine? And I, I, I love being exposed to all that. And, and the only, to me, the only downside to most of what I experienced, I, I had a pretty good experience as a child. I loved growing up, grew mm-hmm. up in church. I loved it. In fact, I had a little, because I grew up in it when I got to college, uh, somebody would start praying and I would just start praying. Somebody pulled me aside. Hey, man, he, he was praying. <laughs> we love the heart, but you know, yeah. you got to be quiet while he prays. So I got right. corrected. Yeah. Um, but the only, the only drawback was just kind of the lack of explanation. You yeah. know, that you know, a lot of times in those environments, God's moving, but I, I didn't really know. And so mm-hmm. that explanation, that leading now, my parents were awesome. You know, they would always yeah. explain to me after the fact. But unless I asked, I, I was just kind of in the yeah. dark. So I love that we've got this opportunity to kind of yeah. shed a little light on it and, and just look at what, what those things mean because yeah. they are so important. And one of the things I love about this section of the book and, and coming from that background is we had the promises of the Lord. And everybody has access to those. But what I learned and I I valued about that experience and and getting saved in that experience, Melissa grew up in that experience, was um, we really, in equal parts, believed that we had the power of God's presence. That's right. Mm -hmm. So we, as much as we believed that we are saved by faith based on what Jesus did on the cross and and his resurrection from, from the tomb, we equally believed that we are filled with his spirit, that we can pray for someone and they can be healed, yep. that we can walk into any environment and see it turn around because the power and presence of God is in us. We equally believe that. Yeah. And like, there's something about my faith I don't take for granted because of like the, some of those moments yep. in those rooms were different. But what it instilled in me, honestly, is, is a confidence that like 
no, I, I can live with the fruit of the Spirit. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I can live with the power of God's presence. Like, that is very available today. Yeah. yeah. And uh, and I'm grateful for that. You know, so we, we, we joke about it, but at the same time, there's a part of it kind of like you're saying is like, I'm so grateful that I didn't have to overcome things to believe that. Yeah. I was almost cut my teeth on that. Does that make yeah. sense at all? Yeah. No, for sure. And I mean, even like, I feel like a lot of people coming to their faith or coming to their faith like later in life, uh, you know, have like a, a timid approach almost of like, well, I don't know, like I'm nervous to pray in front of people or uh, something like that. And so, so even just having an experience like that as a child or, you know, growing up in general, like it, it probably does kind of strip a lot of that away, you know, like you don't have that kind of uncertainty. Yeah. It, there's something about when I read uh, chapter five, and it talks about the glory of the Lord being so present that the priest couldn't do their work. Mm-hmm. Like seeing people who are timid and shy in a moment get transformed yeah. and be able to speak in public. Yep. Seeing people who are crippled and lame and hurt and, and sick in an instant be healed. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And like stand up from moments where they before couldn't walk. Yeah. And to actually see those things like when I read that in verse five or in chapter five, like that's very real to me. Mm -hmm. And I, I, and I would say to, to any of who are joining us, like to believe that these stories are not just, again, they're not just good fairy tales with good characters. Yeah. Like this is the living, breathing, active presence of the Lord. And he's available for all of us, for all of you. And it doesn't have to stop with just having good knowledge of the Bible. Yeah. The Bible in us can transform us, and God's presence in us can give us the power to live beyond what yep. we thought we could. Yep. That's good. Yeah, the miraculous is still available. Mm-hmm. Right. The authority and power of Jesus. Right. And, all, and for those of you, if you kind of wanted to go back through and read those parts, this chapter 5, 6, and 7, I think, um, even where we see God consume the offering, it's pretty awesome. Uh, vision never saw there. that. that <laughs> I've never seen that. Awesome. <laughs> that'd, be that'd be cool. That'd be cool. Hello, thanks for giving that on your, your bucket <laughs> list of things. Yeah, that's, yeah. yeah right. Hey, Can you do that, Lord? Hey, hey Lord, I, uh, I'd love to see that, by the way. Be cool. You're no, available. I, so we see that, and this is also the last we see of uh, the nation of Israel unified. After, after uh, Solomon, we see it break down into the northern kingdom of Israel, yeah. southern kingdom of Judah, and then Second Chronicles spends the rest of the time going through uh, those kings. So I know we don't have time to talk through all the kings, but is there any kings that just kind of stand out to you guys? Well, because we talked about some of them whenever we did our episodes yeah, on the first. Few, there, and there's only a, a, mm-hmm. a few that are mentioned in. Yeah. Um, so we did talk kings, about a few of them back then, but. I would say I, uh, several of them I could talk about. I tend to, and I did this yesterday in the message, I talked just about a couple of episodes of the king. One, one of the things that I think is interesting in Second Chronicles is the way the the writer sort of highlights different moments of the kings, like different things that they Mm -hmm. did and how they did them. Um, I didn't talk about this really uh, yesterday, but my favorite of the kings is Hezekiah. Um, I think it's probably just because of the episode that I did talk about uh, where the Assyrian army came against him and all that kind of stuff. But something I didn't get to was so th- we we talked about this yesterday in the message you can go back and watch it if you weren't able to do that but the assyrian army essentially surrounds the city walls of jerusalem they've already kind of gone throughout the nation of judah and done some damage they had a really violent reputation that preceded them all that kind of stuff well when they surrounded the walls of judah the first thing that hezekiah did was not go to the lord in prayer the first thing that he did was actually turn around and make sure other things were situated first. Like it says that he went to people. Actually, the first thing he did is he went to the military leaders, gave some direction, went to essentially what I think would be like the city leaders. Mm -hmm. And they talked about like making sure that like water didn't flow out to those armies so that they couldn't have anything to drink. And there was just some some strategic things that he did Mm -hmm. to make sure that stuff was led well around him. Then he turned to the people And to the people, he essentially said, hey, listen, we've seen the Lord do greater. They have their weapons, but we have ours. And the the arm of the Lord is stronger than any arm that will come against us. So he encouraged, like he took care of business. He encouraged people. And then the Bible says that he went to God. It says he and um, the prophet Isaiah prayed and God sent one angel. and, And we know the rest of that story. But it's interesting to me, like from a leadership side, I think it shows one of the things that great godly leaders do 
is that they are trusting God. There's a, a constant undercurrent of them like trusting God with the result. But that also doesn't mean that they abdicate the work. Yeah. They are there to like, let's make a plan. Let's encourage people. Let's make sure we have unity and we're headed in the right direction. And also, once we've done all that, we're giving it all over to the Lord because he's got better plans anyway. And so I just, I like that story just from a leadership side because it doesn't abdicate the responsibility and activity of a leader, even a spiritual leader. It says, no, you're going to do all that. But the undercurrent of it all is that God's probably got a better plan anyway. Yeah. And so that to me is what Hezekiah did. It really stands out to me how that worked. And then God sent one angel and took out 185,000 Assyrian troops. And that's a great story. That's pretty awesome. Can you imagine that? Impact. Yeah, the angel kind of like the Terminator, just like. Ah. <laughs> Thank <laughs> like you so much for that imagery. <laughs> I love that visual. <laughs> I like the. Da, 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 I definitely <laughs> appreciate that. Finger pistols. Yeah. Pew, 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 <laughs> pew. pew. <laughs> it's all about the sound effects because the pew pew makes it sound. Did the super angel lame. talk like Arnold Schwarzenegger? I hope so. I, I also hope you're about to. <laughs> I was, I was thinking of wait when talk. I talk in a different voice, it sounds like Shrek, so <laughs> it never works. It never works right, so I just don't even try. Really okay, we'll try do it. Now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I, I'm, fr I'm frozen now. All right. Donkey. <laughs> Donkey. You're I can talk I can talk like, like the donkey better. That's a nice boulder. Look at that boulder. <laughs> and in the morning I make a waffles. And now I, I see a, a, I'm, I'm seeing action packed angel in my head holding guns and talking like donkey. That I'm looks like the terminator <laughs> and talks like donkey. Wow. That's a nice what? boulder. What a trip. <laughs> Look at those Assyrian soldiers. <laughs> Them are some nice soldiers. <laughs> I'm imagining oh. a winged Shrek here, so <clears throat> I think it's winged. time. Winged. Winged. <laughs> All right. Try, trying to get some sort of intelligence back into yeah. my yeah. thought process here. All right. Well, well anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. get, is, that, is that a cue for me to pull us back on track? Yeah, I think so. Sure. Because I, I, no, I can't compete with Donkey. Yeah. But I will say, so one of the kings that he always stands out uh, to me, because, you know, most of the king's names are not very common. Um, oh, really? But there's a couple of names that if you go to South Carolina or Georgia, you actually hear all the time. <laughs> and Asa is one of those. Do you know an Asa? You I do. <laughs> I didn't think about that until you just said it. My wife is from, my wife Stacy, <laughs> she's from South Carolina. A lot of my friends are. And I feel like everybody in South Carolina knows an Asa. And then I went to college in Georgia and everybody knew an Asa. And I actually got to meet a few Aces myself. <laughs> so if your name is Asa, why don't you send off in the comments? Drop a comment below because I've never met one. So we can... Talk about you and your name. Now let's talk about your namesake. Well, thumbs up your comment. <laughs> your namesake all. is found in chapter 14 of Second Chronicles. <laughs> mm. He was King nice. Asa, and I do, I do love this guy. Um, just for what he does, it, it says, Asa did what was good and right in the eyes of the Lord. He removed the foreign altars and the high places, smashed the sacred stones, and cut down the Asherah poles. Uh, he commanded Judah to seek the Lord, the God of their ancestors, and to obey his laws and commands. Uh, and if you move down, chapter, verse se 7 says, Let us build up these towns, he said uh, to Judah, and put walls around them and towers, gates, and bars. It's more of that strategery that you're talking about, Pastor Kevin. Strategery. Uh, it says, Asa had an <laughs> army of 300,000 men from Judah, equipped with large shields, with spears, 280,000 from Benjamin, armed with small shields. They had small shields. Sorry, Benjamin. Uh, and with bows. All of these were brave fighting men. Uh, and it says, verse 11, Asa called to the Lord his God and said, Lord, there is no one like you to help the powerless against the mighty. Help us, Lord God. I love that he is willing to, to talk about his weaknesses and mm -hmm. be vulnerable and give them all to the Lord, but still understands how great God is. Mm -hmm. And so I love that story. It goes on. Chapter 15 is all about Asa's reform. And we'll see several of the kings <coughs> of Judah uh, that kind of walk out some of that reform. One of the other reasons that he, he kind of stands out to me uh, is just because he had an affliction of this. We haven't done this segment in a while, but it kind of goes with cringe the Bible. Because I, can I, can I, is this a safe place? This is a safe place. I just like how I you started know. with, he had an affliction. It depends on what you're about to say. I was trying to be gentle. Very, because very gentle, this, biblical this way is really, of saying really something disgusting. about Asa was jacked up. It's really, really <laughs> disgusting for me. Uh, I don't, I I don't like messed up feet. Like I'm not a big Ooh. like foot person. Like if I see nasty feet walking around a Walmart, I'm probably going to have to leave. That's where they all so live. I don't, so I don't like wretched Sorry, feet. Walmart. And if I can, <laughs> I, I guess, admit some of my downfalls, even when I was, you know, 
I'm looking so scared. for possible ladies I could date or ask out, or maybe even like future wives, like girls that I would date. And I was like, you know what? Can I see myself with her? I would just look down. If they had wretched feet, I'm like, nope, I can't. I can't see myself with that person. So you're you're basically saying you are Eddie Murphy from the movie Boomerang. Basically. Did you ever see Boomerang? I did. Yep. I don't the know 90s classic. Is. You don't know what that yep. is? Not, you can't say so, classic after every movie like it's a classic. Like it, well, well, it kind of is. Yeah, it's, it's a 90s classic. <laughs> it's an all-timer for Eddie Murphy. Oh, all yeah. right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. see? Look, the Shrek is a classic. I don't know about it. Kids in okay, the 80s yeah, and 90s. Please right continue. So, well, and Shrek is also a classic. Yeah. <laughs> So anyway, yeah, you are basically, yeah, uh, all right, I, I can't, I can't do that. So my wife, Stacy, she's beautiful feet. We're good. We got married, <laughs> we've been married for 18 years, <laughs> but all right, Stacey, I still, don't like, let your feet if go. you got messed up feet, I just, I'm, I can be your friend, but <laughs> I can't, can. I can't <laughs> look can at them. Can you be your friend? But if you look at, and you're a surfer. So like when you go hang out with people surfing, is it like you don't borrow their board? Uh, yeah, and you don't want to look, most me? surfers, we don't have good feet. Like I you feel like, like I have kind of nice feet. like when they put their toes over the end of their board. And they well, they, they're just kind of like gnarled up from, I guess, all the force like and the pressure. gnarled. Being in the sun and, You've you have used know. great words. Gnarled. <laughs> gnarled. Very Affliction. descriptive. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm just saying, there's no shame in getting a pedicure if you have wretched feet. I, I, I can't do that. I feel like I would have, I, I, this is not putting anybody down, because I know we've got a few friends on staff that kind of do this. I won't mention any oh, names. Dude's oh. getting pedicures. But I feel like I, I feel like I got to yeah. hand my man card in. Nope, I'm not getting a pedicure. Yeah, I'm good. If no, you I'm have there. nasty feet, as a female, I would like to publicly say, get a pedicure. Well, get over yourself if you have nasty feet. Do I need to like, take feet. my shoe and sock off? And if you do, I will leave. <laughs> and Pastor Jason and I would like to say, as <laughs> dudes, don't. Yeah, just cash your man so card in now. Just uh, fast forward this little part. <laughs> don't of listen to this. I guess. <laughs> I'm here to tell you. Oh, this went a different direction than I thought it would. Well, thanks a lot, Asa. <laughs> yeah, well, and, Asa, nasty and we're not again. We're not talking about a random guy in South Carolina. This is King Asa, <laughs> and it's that he had an affliction of his feet, and we we believe now that it was gout, and he actually he actually like ended up dying from this. <laughs> so Wait a minute, you laughed. I didn't <laughs> laugh. <laughs> I didn't mean to laugh like, and if you've got gout, I'd, I'd definitely apologize. But this is back in the day when they, you know, they didn't have a lot of treatment for this. And he was, he was pretty, I guess, pretty salty about the whole thing anyway. Um, let's see if I can find it. But uh, it. Salty <laughs> feels. <laughs> Lord, we're so sorry. Yes, Lord. <laughs> yeah, we'll get back on track. Well, somebody we got mad at me for talking about was, gout and feet. If, if that was you, caller. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> caller one. Yeah, I'll well, send you a pedicure where, gift card where did here. I, go? I lost my place. <laughs> <laughs> the gout. Oh. Yeah. So no. this is not. To, I know, I've known a few people who had the gout. As you're looking for your place, <laughs> and every time I think of the Adam Sandler lunch lady song. Yeah. You remember I that? Got a bad oh, case a of the gout. Not a bad case of the gout. <laughs> Down my red in hair lunch is lady falling land. out. That I know all of. <laughs> say, that, say that again. <laughs> My red hair is falling out. <laughs> sloppy, Joe, <laughs> sloppy, yeah, sloppy, sloppy Joe. Sloppy <laughs> Joe. Oh, oh, that's good stuff. All right, so verse 7, Navy chapter 16, beats. it says, um, at the, it's right. part of a curse too, by the way. Uh, at that time, uh, Hanani the seer came to Asa king of Judah and said to him, because you relied on the king of Aram and not on the Lord your God, the army of the king of Aram has escaped uh, from your hand. Were not the Cushites and Libyans a mighty army uh, and all this. So they go on. Uh, Asa was angry with the seer because he exposed uh, all that to him, by the way. And so he was so enraged, he put him in prison. And then we see the events of Asa's reign from beginning to end are written in the book of Kings of Judah and Israel. It's another history book. A lot of these are mentioned in every chapter, by the way. Uh, <laughs> in the 39th, uh, the 39th year of his reign, Asa was afflicted with a disease in his feet. Though his disease was severe, even in his illness, he did not seek help from the Lord but only from physicians. A lot of good that did. Uh, then in the 41st year as his, uh, of his reign, Asa died and rested with his ancestors. So my man died of the gout. Mm. And no, Shout like, out to nasty feet. both the doctors is, like, and the Lord. I bet his, I bet his feet were nasty <laughs> even both. before that. But. Well, so that was my cringe and my, my king. Yeah, well, I cringed oh, that repeatedly. So that, that was, was definitely. <laughs> All right, so moving on from what that. we learn from that? We learned. Take care of your feet. We learned there's a correlation pedicures. between Asa and the Lunch Lady song from mm. that pedicures are not cool for no, dudes. that pedicures are the way to go, for mm. sure. They would have been for Asa, <laughs> but it's too late. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so we do hmm, have a section. I was going to say we do do a section, and then I was, I'm not going to say, I'm not going to say do-do on the section. 
podcast because then I would laugh at myself. We do have a section that we do here on the podcast called Inquiring Minds where, you know, people people have questions. Mm. And I feel after that last segment, people are going to have a lot of They're questions. They're going to have more questions. <laughs> Specifically about those. the That's credentials of our staff. You can send those questions directly to Caroline Baldwin. <laughs> yeah. Life Point Church. Yeah, I'll give her a heads up. <laughs> uh, anyway, so we've got a couple questions um, that we can hit real quick before we wrap up this episode. But... Uh, the first one for our inquiring minds, a lot of the rules and guidelines established in Chronicles appear to be either completely new additions to the tradition or, oh no, what is that word? Extrapolations. Yeah. Oh my goodness. I can say that word. I can't see a name (laughs) in the Bible, but I can say that word. Inquiring minds. I went to NC State, guys. Come on. Like, okay. Extrapolations. Is that what you said? That's made up for yeah, sure. Yeah, extrapolations. Okay. On passages from the Pentateuch, it would appear that they are painting history in a light that gives credibility credibility to their own agenda. Uh, the question here is, can Caroline read and or <laughs> 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 have any? Uh, uh. <laughs> also, just a heads up, I won't be answering these questions because clearly. All right. Uh, does the behavior explain how Judaism ended up with so many rules and regulations in Jesus' day? And is this something that we see in our world today? I hope y'all understood that. You got one. that one, PK. Yeah. I'm reading it again. <laughs> so I'm, I'm just, sorry. Was I not clear yeah. by my? <laughs> no, I appreciate you reading that. Uh, Do you? Because I don't. I'm praying for an interpretation. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Um, so why don't you explain it? Like I don't know what most of those words mean, Caroline. Can yeah. you ask that again? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like look up the uh, look up under each function what here. What does extrapolations mean? Yeah, you know that word. So what does that word mean, Pastor Jason? I just said what it said. I just <laughs> he just can pr- <laughs> pronounce words. <laughs> so like an elaboration on the passage from the yeah. Pentateuch. Yeah. So, so the way I, I take that question though is is asking like because Second Chronicles is so different mm-hmm. from First Kings, and we see like if you look at the history of Judaism. Uh, up until rabbinical law, rabbinical influence, even into like the first few centuries uh, A.D. <clears throat> like, d- do we think that this is where a lot of that started, like the adding to the law? Um, and it, they actually did start a lot of that. Even in David's time, there was a, there was a, quite a few things added to the law. Because if you look at David, he actually added musicians uh, to the tabernacle. Uh, that wasn't in the law originally. There were extra things that they, they started doing. Uh, little, I guess, li- li- liberties. That, that they took, and a lot of this was through voices of the prophets, uh, through the voices of the kings, uh, and so a lot of that stuff. But really, uh, and I don't, I don't, I mean, this is just from personal study. I could definitely be wrong, uh, but just from the way I read things and the way it, what I've seen through history, I don't think it so much starts here. We definitely see some things kind of being added. I, I feel like a lot of those things were kind of drawn out of the law and not really added to the law. Uh, what we where we really see modern day Judaism being established is actually Pastor Kevin to the audience that you were talking about uh, the exiles that came back whenever Ezra uh, and Nehemiah and even uh, Zerubbabel before Ezra these guys were the ones that were really responsible for establishing what we see as modern day Judaism and rabbinical law so I don't I don't really see that in as much in Second Chronicles I see a lot of things omitted from you know kings and samuel um and very few things that are added in like one of the things that that's kind of funny that that could i guess be noted as a discrepancy like if you look count the number of laborers and their list with who rebuilt the temple in some of the cities for solomon if you compare those lists to kings and second chronicles uh the breakdowns are different like the numbers to the category is different but they get the exact same totals Mm-hmm. which is, is kind of funny. That's probably just a scribe's thing, you know, something like that. It doesn't mean that it's wrong. doesn't mean there's anything we can take away. It just means that somebody put a number with the wrong category, but we still get the same totals. So just little fun things like that. Uh, it's also a great excuse to kind of read the, those books of the Bible for yourself and just see what can you pick out, what questions do you have. Uh, but again, like you look, got to look for the purpose of Second Chronicles. It doesn't say anything that, uh, that doesn't affirm kings. It just focuses on different things. So I, I don't. I wouldn't say that it, it. That this is where we see modern Judaism and the beginning of adding to to that rule. But it's definitely a great question. Mm. <clears throat> I'll go with that. Did that make sense? Does that make sense? <laughs> Ditto. <laughs> sure. Yeah. <laughs> I'm still making sense of the question. <laughs> those are those words are bigger than I know how to. That's a. <laughs> Those are $5 words. <laughs> they are $5 Well, and, and words. even if you look, so it's, um, 
I feel because I love validation. You know, we were talking about context earlier. You know, you want to know when it was written, who it was written to. Uh, and those are to help build context. But it's also for to help add validity to the claims of this is who it said it was. And this is this is uh, this was a real writing by the real people. And one of the reasons we can put so much stock in the foundations and the, the proof of the Old Testament stuff. Um, so that's why I like that. But it, it also works the same way because in the, the Chronicler, if we can call him, uh, through the, the, the Kings, you know, we see mentioned <laughs> everywhere. It, it points to you can find out more about this king in this other work. And it's another work of antiquity. So they weren't just taking stories and putting them themselves. They were putting in place validity for themselves because they didn't have bibliography like we do. Mm -hmm. So they were actually putting in their own footnotes and bibliography. Mm. Um, okay, so the second second question. Uh, we treat First Samuel and Second Kings as history and Chronicles as an elaboration slash interpretation. How do we know that Chronicles is not actually the accurate version of history, and what makes us think that First Samuel and Second Kings are more accurate? I don't. I don't know that I would think of it as an elaboration or interpretation. I view Second First and Second Chronicles both as history, but it's it's more of God's activity in history. Mm -hmm. Like it, they're, they're just trying to highlight a different thing. I mean, it's, it's the same as like, like I could tell a story from my childhood and I could use that story to probably illustrate three or four different things. Mm -hmm. And I, I view the history as that. Now, whether or not we know that Chronicles is not actually the accurate version of history, what makes me think first, first Samuel through second Kings is more accurate. I don't think one is more accurate than the other. I, I, there, it's there's accuracy, but the point of the stories are different, yep. and so I just find simplicity of it in that. Like yeah. they just had different purposes. Well, and I, I feel like there, there's accuracy and there's precision, you know. Yeah. And I, I don't see either. I don't see really see either work as just like this precise, detailed order of, of history. It's a collection. Yeah. Uh, of history, which is why, I mean, even going back to Second Kings, like there are other, other sources mentioned if you want to find out more, more details. The same thing that the Chronicle does. This was a common practice. <clears throat> so it's it, similar to the Gospels, you know, like, yeah. I mean, they're written different and, yeah. and they're written differently either on purpose or on personality. Yeah. Like the writer sometimes was the reason it was written different. Yeah. So and it, I think the, the big takeaway from them is it, there's, there's nothing that's really contradictory mm -hmm. uh, because yeah. if you see Chronicles, it's, it doesn't mean that it's a not an accurate depiction of history. It just means there there are things that that weren't told. There there weren't uh, things that were focused on, like the fact that Solomon had so many wives and concubines, mm -hmm. you know, like you know several more of the indiscretions of David. And again, you you look at the focus, like even in this time, uh, even with with David, you know, you see read more about his generals and his mighty men, and actually several families of the mighty men that are mentioned that aren't mentioned in um, Kings. So it's just uh, to me, it's just. It, I don't think their, again, their goal wasn't to be like an accurate history book. Like, here's everything you need to know about everything. It was like, here's what we're going to focus on as we go back and rebuild our nation. And history is seen through one lens when you're winning, and it's seen through another when you're losing. Yeah. yeah. It's seen through one lens when you're encouraged and another when you're discouraged. Yep. And the nation of Israel was not winning. They were not even the nation of Israel yeah. anymore. And they were discouraged, and what they needed was what First and Second Chronicles brought. Yeah, mm -hmm. well, it's a it's a great illustration too, because just like with Teddy Roosevelt, I love Teddy Roosevelt. I've got several biographies on Teddy Roosevelt. Now, why would I have several biographies of the same guy? They tell the same story. None of them contradict, but they have different focuses right. and even elaborate on on different stories. It gets yeah, you good. can read multiple things and get a much uh, better view of the bigger no, picture. That's great. Yeah. All right, our last question is, uh, Chronicles treats the reign of the kings differently than 1 Samuel through 2 Kings. The chronicler, <laughs> the chronicler, elevates the kingship okay. rather than condemning it as idolatry. Why might this be the case, and why would it be important for the chronicler not to speak ill of, the, of kingship? Um, I mean, I would read that and say, I don't, I wonder, I don't know that it's intentional that they're not speaking ill of kingship. I think that again, the purpose of the book is is to reveal God's presence and God's power, even through kings. Mm -hmm. And so, 
I, I don't know that that was intentional, that they would not speak ill of kings. I think that, again, there's, there's a point that's trying to be made, and the point is we've got to reveal what God was up to and doing through all of this. I do think the people who were in uh, exile most likely knew how they got there. The, probably the stories that had been told were stories that had been told about how bad things were. There's actually a psalm, and I can't remember which one, uh, but it, it starts out, I think it's the first verse or two, and it says, by the rivers of Babylon we sat and wept, and our hearts were hung in the trees. And essentially what they were saying was they had lost their song. All they were rehearsing was everything that they had done to get there, like everything that had yeah. gotten them in that place. They knew the bad. What they needed was what the, the chronicler <laughs> or the writer of Chronicles, <laughs> what he was bringing was yeah. this is what God can do. And so I, I would say that it's because of that. Yeah. yeah. Well, and the, the whole goal was him. He was reminding what, what Israel looked like, what it needed to feel like, why they fell, and how could they not fall again. Yeah. And so he's given a, uh, details. Like, so it wouldn't be important to know that Solomon had all these wives, and that's not, you know, that's inconsistent with the, the law of Deuteronomy or the law of Moses. Like, what was important was how did he build the temple? What materials did he use? What was the architecture? What was the, what was the, pl- what was the layout? What cities? They even, uh, when they came back, we'll, we'll find out in Ezra and Nehemiah, they actually even brought back the cities of refuge which we read about yeah. early in the Old Testament. So those are all the things that they needed to know. They didn't really need to know that, that David had Bathsheba's husband killed. You didn't need to know even if, uh, if um, at our uh, other of the, the kings, or the kings that were seen as godly, didn't really need to know their full history. But what did they do to establish God's reign over Israel? So I don't see it. I, I see them focusing on being king, king and kingdom minded, but not so much on the man of the king, yeah. but remembering who, who the source is. Good. Like God gave the authority. God gave the, the resource. Yeah, I like that. It's good. It's good. Well, um, as always, any, anybody that has questions about the books coming forward, you can submit them to podcasts at lifepointnow.com for any kind of questions if you, too, have an inquiring mind. And if you could use smaller words. I would appreciate it <laughs> personally. I uh, love it. What's the word that, that we got hung up on? I don't know. I think I probably would probably got deleted. Extra- Extrapolations. 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 It's one of those words that I've definitely like heard before, but I've never said because, you know, I'm not a nerd. <laughs> no offense. <laughs> just kidding. I just, I just say that because I don't know what it means. So That's a nice boulder. That's, a nice That's boulder. the extent of what I know how to pronounce right here. <laughs> Well, we have successfully binged yet another book of the Bible, I think. It. Congratulations, yeah. guys. Good job, everyone. We've both extensively talked about Second Chronicles and Eddie Murphy. And we extrapolated <laughs> on both of them. We, extra- <laughs> we <laughs> extrapolated all over this place. <laughs> I don't know what that means. i got to be careful. <laughs> That's going to do it for today's episode of Bonus Features. If you enjoyed this week's episode, like this video, comment, and subscribe to our YouTube channel or to the pod on any streaming services. If you have questions about today's content, email podcast at lifepointnow.com. Don't forget to follow us on socials at LifePointNow and have a great week.